Like many people who get interested in the lute, I started off playing the guitar and I found myself playing lots of transcriptions of lute music and harpsichord music and early music generally on the guitar. So it was quite natural to want to play that music on the lute. Another attraction actually was that the lute is a much more social instrument. The repertoire of the guitar is very much solo music and uh, there are lots of lute duets, there are lots of songs, and uh, you can play continuo, and uh, all of this was very attractive to me. So eventually I managed to buy a lute. Almost as soon as I'd done so, I discovered that actually there are lots of different kinds of lute. And because the lute repertoire is so enormous and covers such a wide span of time, about three centuries, from about 1500 to about 1800, you really can't play all of that music on one instrument. You need several different instruments. And so it's quite natural to want to play music from a particular period on the instrument for which it was written. And so I couldn't afford to buy another lute, so I decided to have a go at making one. Uh, I had some woodwork experience. I had some bad woodwork experience at school. I had some slightly better woodwork experience with making model aeroplanes. Uh, and in fact a very specialised kind of model aeroplane which involved making very, very light structures and very, very accurate. So maybe that had some influence on, on the, uh, the loop making which I've subsequently done. is a seven course lute. It has 13 strings, uh, six arranged in pairs and one single string at the top. Often this single string was in fact a double string uh, at the time when this kind of lute was, uh, was very popular which is the end of the 16th century. And this particular lute is typical of the kinds of lutes that were made um, by German makers in northern Italy in Venice and Padua at the end of the 16th century. The body is made up of thin strips of wood. We call these ribs. Um, in this case, it has thin strips also sandwiched between the ribs to give that effect. Um, it has what we call a capping strip around the end, which reinforces the, the construction of the body. Um, at this end of the loop, there is a, uh, a block um, in this case made of willow, you can't see it, it's inside, which, to which all the ribs are joined. And then the neck is joined to the block with um, a butt joint, 
and there's a screw or a nail which goes through the block and into the neck to reinforce that joint. Um, the semitones along the strings are determined by gut frets which are tied round the neck and having frets which are simply tied in place means that you can actually move them slightly to, uh, to adjust the tune. Uh, the strings go over a, a very sharp angle as they go into the peg box over what we call the nut, which in this case is made of bone. The bridge is just a solid piece of wood. It's actually rather light. It's actually it's cut away at the back and at the front, and its function really is to just provide an attachment point for the strings, um, and it mustn't be too too heavy. Uh, the um, the rose is a purely decorative feature. It has to be some kind of opening in the sample, but the size of the opening is not particularly important, and the design of the rose is even less important. The designs are traditional designs which were used by makers from the earliest leaps that we know about right through to some of the latest mm -hmm. ones, so they're not particular to any maker. This, this, uh, this is a complete loop back. Um, it's, made, it's been made on a solid mould, which is the shape of the inside of the loop back. When I take it off, you see that the, the back is made of very thin wood, these very thin ribs, uh, which are bent on a, on a bending iron. Um, a piece of rib from a different loot. It's bent on this bending iron. So if we want to make a lute which is based as closely as possible on a historical model, the obvious thing to do is to find a lute in a museum and um, use that as a basis for the modern reconstruction. Um, what we have here is a drawing, a very accurate drawing of a lute in the Warwick County Museum. Uh, it's, it dates in its present form from the 17th century and um, this drawing shows exactly what the instrument is like now, warts and all, as it were. There are various distortions, obviously, that have happened over the, over the centuries, and some, what you might call, inaccuracies in the original construction. The body, for example, is not completely symmetrical. We don't think there's anything systematic about that. It just happens to be a little bit wonky. So we're going to have to make another drawing, which will which we can use as a basis for our reconstruction, which straightens out some of these little irregularities. The history of the lute is largely a history of increasing the number of strings on the instrument. The lute was well established in European musical culture by the 15th century, uh, and it was also towards the end of the 15th century that people started playing the lute with their fingers rather than with a plectrum, and this gave rise to a new kind of notation 
specifically intended for the lute called tablature. And starting in 1507, the whole string of publications came from Italian presses right through the 16th century. And they are all for a lute with six courses, six pairs of strings, top string often single. This, if you like, is the classic form of the lute in the 16th century. Towards the end of the century, uh, people started to add more and more strings to the lute. We think this may be due to developments in string technology, uh, amongst other things. And by about 1600 or so, um, lutes of nine and sometimes even ten courses were being used. And the extra strings were all added in the bass. So the original six strings are as they are here, but then with an extra set of strings in the bass, giving more scope for playing lower notes and also being able to play lots of notes as open strings rather than as strings stopped on the fingerboard. Lutes had always been made in a variety of sizes, partly because people wanted to use them not just for solo music but for accompanying the voice and other instruments. And towards the end of the 16th century, um, there was increasing use of the lute in early opera and things which required uh, a very loud lute. Uh, and one way to make a lute more brilliant is to take a very large lute but tune it at a very high pitch. Um, but of course that's impossible normally because the top string is already tuned very close to breaking point. So a kind of lute was developed where the top string and sometimes the second string as well were tuned an octave lower than the normal pitch and that results in a rather strange tuning that we call a re-entrant tuning. Um, another problem was to get a strong enough bass and one way to make the bass stronger is to have very long bass strings. And so around the middle of the 1590s, this instrument was developed, called the Orbo. It's essentially a bass lute with the re-entrant tuning of the top two strings. And it also has long bass strings, which go to an upper peg box, nearly twice as long as the, the uh, strings on the fingerboard. So you have really, essentially, the top six strings of the lute, and then a series of, um, of eight, uh, seven or eight long bass strings, which are played only as open strings, like a harp. Um, they're tuned to a scale so that you can play almost any bass note that you want to play as an open string. By 1600, the lute had not only gained more strings, there was also some experimentation with the tuning. And uh, the French, in particular, started detuning the upper strings of the lute so that the first string was tuned to a lower pitch than before. And eventually, this process led to the development of 
completely new tunings for the top six strings, uh, which gave more, gave different resonances to the instrument, and they got very interested in exploring these these resonances. This kind of lute uh, developed yet more courses, uh, and the classic French lute of the 17th century has 11 courses, and this persisted. This type of lute was used until around 1700, uh, at which point interest in the lute in France really died out, essentially. And the Germans, or German-speaking countries, took over uh, this lute and added yet more strings to it, uh, and we end up with a 13-course lute by about 1720.